many of us understand that the law is on the side of the rich and privileged. Marx called the factory the hidden abode of production, on whose threshold there stares us in the face no admittance except on business. The offices of politicians and judges could be called the hidden abode of legislation, and what happens there is no less a form of exploitation. How did the law become like this? How does it function as an instrument of exploitation? And is there a way to fix it? These are the questions addressed by David Renton's 2022 Against the Law, <laughs> Why Justice Requires Fewer Laws and a Smaller State. David is a prolific writer, uh, the author of more than a dozen books, including the acclaimed Fascism, History and Theory, published by Pluto Press. David is also a barrister and a professor of law at the London School of Oriental and African Studies, or SOAS. Joining us is also Brahim, a labor lawyer in the U.S. with an interest in critical legal theory. Hopefully with him, we'll be able to get a bit more of the transatlantic perspective on the anti-capitalist legal theory. Uh, David and Brahim, thank you both very much for joining us today. Uh, so David, just to start us off with today, would you like to introduce yourself, your work, and what brought you to the subject of this book? Um, well, um, what I do for a living is I'm a barrister, and again, I'm, I'm guessing um, in the States you, you, you kind of do and kind of don't have that, if it really makes sense. Here anyway, we, we have two bits of the legal profession, we have solicitors and we have barristers. Um, a barrister is someone who spends their day um, in court, so um, I'm currently watching Better Call Saul with my, um, that, that, that essential legal documentary with my 14 year old. And, you know, when I started off being a barrister, my working life was a lot like um, Saul's. The, you know, I'd have criminal clients and all that ducking and diving and the weaving and negotiating. Watching it felt tremendously familiar to me, although obviously our, our legal systems are different. Um, for about 13 years, I've, I've principally been a civil barrister which means that the, the law I do is it's housing, it's employment, and it's things like that. Um, you could say it's kind of the social democratic bits of, of law. It's, it's the parts where the state has, for whatever reason, said the rich and powerful can't always get the things that they want. Um, and that's the law I do and have done. That's how I get my hands set. I've been doing that now for a bit over a dozen years. Uh, like I said that's what I do. Um, as for um, why I wanted to write the book, um, I'm, I'm involved with lots of different left and legal left networks. One is the Haldane Society of Socialist Lawyers. Um, you know, what I wanted to, to kind of express in a more theoretical, more extended way was all the gripes and the, the grievances and frustrations that, that people have as left wing lawyers in Britain. Um, all the sense that we have that the, um, movements um use this the wrong way they kind of over litigate and over rely on us and particularly at, at a certain moment i'm sure we'll get into this later which is essentially that um we've had economic neoliberalism where just everything was about cuts and and you know shrinking the state now we've got this new era of populism which is kind of a bit like neoliberalism a bit unlike neoliberalism and it, it seems to me that that what's been going on and i'll put it in the shortest version now what's been going on is, is kind of the left has been saying well whatever the other side's doing we've got to do the opposite so if the other side is saying we're now troublemakers we're about change the left is making itself very conservative in response to them um we're saying that we're the people who don't want change who don't want disorderly change who don't want their chaos and um, one of the big things I'm trying to say in my book is essentially that's a really catastrophic piece of political positioning, whether that's the left now we're talking about in France, in Italy, in Germany, in America or Britain, all over the world, just, there's this phenomenon going on. And we really shouldn't be lining up in the way we have been. Yeah. Um, so I'm just curious, um, as I was reading your book, um, I was struck by um, your argument that we need to pull away from, we have to move towards a de movement, as you just discussed, move away from uh, the, having these organizations put legislate, uh, sorry, litigation front and center and uh, towards something more like a, a direct action, more on the ground activism. Although I'm new to the law, I've already uh, seen that organizations, whether it's housing rights groups, labor right groups, criminal uh, justice groups, all currently, as you also discuss in your book, are committed to these very uh, litigious um, form of activism. 
uh, I'm curious, how can we convince these institutions that are potential allies um, in de-certification? How can we convince them to move away from their well-entrenched um, systems, well-entrenched mechanisms? And also, should we? Should we try to move them away or should we be trying to build counter institutions of some sort? Um, if I take the second question first, should we try and get people to um, move away from the law? Um, I think I think there's there's kind of different things going on in this. The answer. I mean, the short answer is a matter of strategy, we should. Um, but as a matter of tactics, it's more complicated. Um, you, you could sort of like, you could put different kinds of legal issues on a continuum. And at one end is something like, um, say, a trade union struggle um, being fought by a union which is strongly supported by the workers in that industry or workplace. And um, where where there's a rank and file that's really easy to identify and they're conscious and they're politically active. Now, at that point, it's very easy to turn around and say, right, um, our strategy should be to get those people to organise and those people to use their industrial power, which they have. If they strike, if they campaign, if their if their strikes um, win victories, it's very easy to see the utility of that strategy, and therefore would say, why on earth would you try and litigate this? Why on earth would you say, in a British context, oh, don't go on strike? If we go to the employment tribunal, because in the UK we have a highly developed system of individual employment courts where people have employment disputes can go to court instead of collectivising. If you individualise, we say that weakens you. So that argument's really easy to see. Um, but there are all sorts of people kind of at the other end. If you think that's that's one place where it's quite easy to see the argument. Um, there, are, there are people at, at the other end where um, I'd say we want to juridify their complaints. Um, but, you know, it's about timing and it's about thinking about how to do it. And that's something you'd have to think through quite hard. So if you want to take kind of the opposite experience, again, I'm going to give a British example just because that's what I'm most familiar with. And I appreciate some of this doesn't directly translate to, to US context. But, for example, a lot of the law I do is I'm representing, say, really vulnerable people who've got very intense forms of illnesses, often psychiatric illnesses, and they're threatened with being evicted from their homes, essentially, say, because their behaviour is strange, disruptive. And the people complaining about them are their fellow neighbours, their fellow tenants. Now, I would love to turn around to that community of people and say, right, what we need to do is we need to do ev eviction blocks. The next time the bailiffs are called, we're just going to get the whole block to occupy the housing and stop this neighbour being evicted. But if this person's behaviour is such that actually the kind of the, the community that, that doesn't totally trust them is their neighbours, it's actually quite hard to do that. So you might turn around and say, all right, the, the strategy is to de those sorts of things which might go to court, but you might have to think quite hard about, um, there'd probably be two or three other things you'd have to do to, to persuade tenants to see, for example, to stop treating one each other, one and another as, as enemies. And if you really wanted to turn that around, I think you can only start turning around when you've got much more confident social movements than we've got now. Um, we don't have, um, in this country, I don't know if you have in the States, I'm kind of guessing you don't. We, we don't have the sorts of social movements you might have had, say, in Britain in the 40s, where people would turn around to local authorities and say, you've got to house everyone. And actually would be actively demanding resource, not necessarily for themselves as individuals, but just for absolutely everyone. So some, some, of, my, um, some of my book, I suppose, is, is it's about encouraging people to see that big picture get that ambitious and have an idea that we could actually achieve these things even if building up the counterpower to get to that point might in reality take a bit of time so there's there's definitely like a utopian bit of my book i'm, I'm not saying that all these things things we can do next week the thing we can do next week is to say strategically we're going to try as movements to to cease to depend to the extent that we do on the law but quite how you work that out in different struggles and in practice can take a bit of time um, so, so should we? Yes. Um, then your other question was, um, how do you persuade people to do it? Um, and I think really, you know, again, it, all you can do is, is that you turn around to individual struggles and say, look, this, this 
protest is happening now, draw the lessons from it. I'll, I'll give you an example um, of, of how, of a moment where you could do that, yeah? Right now in Britain, um, there's this really interesting thing going on because we had lockdown and the lockdown we had all these laws saying you weren't allowed out of your house, which, you know, like in common with most of the world, yeah? Um, and of course here, one of the laws we had, the laws where you weren't allowed to protest. Um, we had the most extraordinary campaign, even while all demonstrations were still banned. So even quite in the middle of the, the fiercest part of the, of the pandemic, um, there was this extraordinary scandal which arose when um, a um, police officer saw um, a white middle class um, woman, Sarah Everhard, going home in London, arrested her and ended up raping and killing her. And this became absolutely massive news in the UK. Um, there were protests, like when all protests were banned, um, Kate Middleton, you know, the king's daughter-in-law, was going along to give flowers to the memory of Sarah Everard and support the women who were protesting. It went so deep into like the mainstream. For, for a few days, everyone accepted that that kind of police violence was um, completely unacceptable. Well, I was very struck in the last couple of days that, that there was one of the main women who was arrested on Sarah Everard process, a woman called Patsy Stevenson, who was a very iconic photograph. She had bright red hair and she was arrested. It felt like she was arrested by about 50 cops at once. When, in the last, cu last couple of days, um, she, she, she sued the police. In the last couple of days, the police have settled and they, they agreed to pay her a very large sum of money. And it was quite extraordinary because this campaign started really quite moderate. Now, this Patsy Stevenson, who's kind of the poster person of this campaign, goes on Twitter and, and um, posts the words, um, all cops are bastards. And it's like, oh, my God, Middle England supported her. How can we support someone saying this crazy thing? I thought what was really interesting was her justification for saying it. She said, look, I'm not saying all individual police officers are bad. What I'm saying is there's an institutional power here. There's a certain way the police behave, which means that police officers as a class are complicit in sexual violence against women. And people just got it. And I think that's kind of all you can do is that you just respond to the individual campaigns and each one as they rise, they show, look, what can we learn from this? What can we learn from this is that this individual police officer is not a lone individual. It's a systemic way of the police behaving. And again, why do they do that? It's not just because they're bad people, whatever. It's because they fit, they have a certain relationship to the law um, and the law is not our friend. I think that actually leads on really well to the next question that I had for you. Um, I hope you don't mind, David, uh, if I note the irony of a lawyer <laughs> having written this book. I'm thinking of Engels' uh, 1887 essay, Lawyer's Socialism, which outlines the Marxist critique of human rights and, and kind of the limitations of attempts to uh, settle political and social disputes through the medium of a juridical system. Uh, and of course, this is also an important topic of your book, Against the Law. So I was wondering, could you talk us through your use of the Marxist critique of rights here and the alternative that you develop over the course of the book? Well, I mean, I, I don't think in the book, I actually specifically cite that, that, um, that particular um, article of Engels. But what I do do is I sort of go through, um, I just sort of give a potted history of how Marx and Engels talked about rights and law, which they had been doing ever from really the moment which they start being independent activists. And um, by the period, the period I really do talk about is just slightly earlier, but I think it's still going on in that Engels piece, which is that um, you've got, you've, you've got in Europe for the first time social democracy. You've got a party of people in Germany who are committed to, to try and have left-wing political politics. And guess what? It's led by people who just think Marx and Engels are great. So you'd have thought, therefore, OK, the old guard, you know, they're going on about 1883. Engels is what, like 65. Here I'm talking about 1875. And Marx is 57. So, you know, you have old activists who basically only exist in order to sit around and tell the young people they've got it wrong. Um, but, you know, you'd have thought Marx would be a bit more cheerful than that because they'd be going, well, look, um, these people say they're Marxists. This is great. 
but but there's an argument they come across again and again from the 1870s to the 1880s onwards. It's the same argument, in, even though it takes slightly different forms. But it always goes something like this: the young German socialists. Now they've got um, they've got um, hundreds of thousands of voters. They're going to have millions of voters quite soon. They've got sister parties copying them all over Europe. They feel the whole winds behind us. Look, what would we do if we got power? And their answer, really simply, is that we need to kind of come up with strategic reforms which would permanently embody socialist values into the state. Um, and this is great because, the, you know, like this is this is an argument that, you know, leftists have heard a hundred times since over the, previous, over the following century. Yeah. And they come up with, you know, well, like, could we come up with um, equal pay? Could we say that that? Everyone who works for the state has got a type of freedom of opinion and freedom of expression. We have laws preventing the state from banning people because they're too left. All, all these things sound like great socialist legal reforms. But these curmudgeonly old gets, Marx and Engels, their continuous response um, to these movements is to say, look, if you try and do that without actually having the wider transfer of power that we keep on saying to you is actually the whole point of our project, if you just try and get those reforms, even these strategic, ambitious structural reforms, without achieving that transfer of social power, these reforms will be worth nothing because there is no notion of equality which isn't capable of being adopted by capitalism as a um, as a sort of long term capitalist value. And again, you know, like I'm not quite the Marx and Engels age, but I'm getting almost to that point of my life. And it's very striking for me that there are all sorts of things which, when I was a kid, were you know people were absolutely convinced were permanently socialist values which capitalism could never adopt sincerely. I mean, like um, opposition to sexism, opposition to homophobia, belief in equal marriage rights for everyone. There was no way those reforms could ever be achieved. They have been achieved, and yet we still got capitalism. But. But more fundamentally still, the, the kind of moment to which my book is written is like we're facing climate change. Um, if we're not going to all burn to death on a relatively short time scale, pretty obviously um, there need to be massive legal reforms. So what you're getting is in lots of countries all at once, people um, taking in relation to the environment exactly the same positions the generation of German socialists were taking 125 years ago in terms of social justice, the welfare state and so on. They're saying if we could just make these strategic legal reforms, then even this state would have to, in 2023, would have to take steps to avert climate catastrophe. And one of the arguments in my book is um, actually Marx and Engels were right in relation to that generation and this argument, and it is actually the same argument today. Right. And, you know, at the, at the very end of your book, um, you hearken to Mario Tronti. Um, you say uh, change must happen outside and against the law. And uh, just earlier, you said the law is not our friend. Um, although your arguments are very convincing, uh, as, a, as a young lawyer uh, who's about to enter the field, who many of my friends are, you know, progressive lawyers who want to make a difference. I'm curious, what role do you see lawyers having in this shift? Is there still a place for lawyers in in these movements, and 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 how can how can we be a part of de-juridification? I think maybe part of the answer is is that lawyers need to be part of the set of people who put in this propagandist argument that the law cannot deliver, and the solution is to be found in people's own individual counterpower. Um, and to base it on our experience and sometimes to show that in court. You know, I mean, I mean, a sort of practical example about this. You think about um, um, the, the trial in, in Chicago in 68, Chicago 7, Chicago 8, you know. Um, people want to create, like, like people still telling that story. And in America, it seems like there was, there was that film that came out about three or four years ago. People want to make that story a story about liberalism somehow and how great liberalism is um like they made that film on amazon and you can watch it and there's a sort of key moment where where um in in our present day retelling of it by um liberals you know um the argument somehow becomes that the great thing about the chicago, about the chicago protesters was that 
they turned around and they believed in elections somehow. I don't know how this got written in, but if you watch it now, that seems to be the thing, like the good ones believe in elections. Um, the reason why that story was so amazing was because a bunch of protesters, assisted by lawyers, but with the lawyers playing a subordinate and lesser role, turned round to a court in the middle of the height of, of the American left, with people on the streets, with the army losing in Vietnam, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and said, um, if you're going to try us, we're going to make the the court and the law itself look impossible and unsustainable. You know, so it's things like showing up in court and revealing, stripping off their clothes, and they've got a cop's outfit on beneath. It's like being willing to, you know, protesting to the point where people are supposedly giving testimony and the cops having to come to court and just smash the demonstrators around the face because they're refusing to comply with the judge. It's about, in that case, I'm being willing to call the judge a Nazi and just keeping on keeping on calling him that. And, and through a situation there of just, in effect, completely refusing to cooperate um, with a hostile power who that, that was intending to use law as part of a general strategy, smashing the politicised young in that country at that time. Um, now, that's kind of an extreme example. Um, as a lefty lawyer, your chances to pull something like that off are kind of rare. Um, but it's about going into every single legal battle thinking like that and thinking, um, if you're a lawyer, thinking, I'm up against a hostile power. And if need be, it's really quite likely, likely that I'm going to have to try and to get a proper lasting victory. I'm going to have to go outside law. I may have to appeal to the public, to public opinion, to whatever. But I'm going to have to do that. And I'm not going to be afraid of, of doing that. And I'm going to put that strategy of me in opposition to the state above getting a better political, getting a bit nicer legal career where I get promoted faster. I'm going to be the, you know, the, 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 the piece of grit in the machine that's encouraging lawyers to think like that. So it's not saying, you know, everyone rip up your law books, don't do law, go off and do something else instead. It's saying even people who've chosen that have acquired a certain set of skills. You can use those skills, but you can only use them um, effectively if you're using them against um, the grain of the state. And then for everyone else, because, you know, most people aren't lawyers. For, for everyone else, it's about saying, um, you know, if, you, if you're in a situation where people... Um, are using the law as a way of, of dampening down your movements and uh, a t of taking the, the steam or the energy out of them. That isn't natural. That isn't automatic. You don't have to accept that. There's nothing about the relationship between social movements and, um, and their lawyers, which means you always have to believe lawyers, you always have to accept lawyers, you always have to do what lawyers want you to do. There's nothing even that says that... Um, you know, there aren't going to be some more lefty lawyers out there if that's what you want to do. So it's it's about saying to people, trust yourselves to democratise your relationship to the law. You know, like in Britain, they often do meetings, I talk about, I often get people to show up their hands and everyone's going like, um, I ask people like, you know, who's got an employment contract? All right, who knows what's written in their employment contract? Who's got a tenancy contract? Who knows what's written in their tenancy contract? It's about denaturalizing the 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 way in which all of us live that vast amounts of our interactions with other people are governed by this thing and capitalism tells us keep quiet don't think about it but 90 percent of these things things you won't know about and won't understand and i'm saying there's nothing out there which anyone shouldn't understand there's nothing out there which which anyone doesn't have the right to know and there's nothing out there to stop people changing their relationship to the law. Hearing you talk just then, um, it reminded me of uh, some of the famous stories that we've received around Robespierre. Um, of course, uh, there's the great story of when he uh, put uh, the King of France on trial. And he said, this trial is superfluous because the very fact that you're being tried shows that your authority no longer exists, that the uh, popular, that the edict of the people has overturned your sovereignty. Um, and then, of course, uh, at the end of his life, uh, in, uh, I think, as his head was being laid down on the guillotine, uh, he made this declaration that in being killed, they would have taken nothing from him because he had already given his life to the revolution. <laughs> um, 
But it, it's interesting, of course, how, uh, in a sense, the kind of extra legal program that you're advocating in this book, or this program for seeking justice through extra legal means, uh, in a sense, repeats this exception to the legal framework that we see at the very origin of modern liberalism. I mean, obviously you talk about Schmidt a lot in this book, but one thinks immediately of the famous line that starts off Agamben's homo sacer, bare life is what founds the city of men. It's, it's the exception that starts off the law. And then in a sense, uh, as you demonstrate over the course of this book, uh, for a progressive response to the law, what's necessitated is stepping outside of it in the same way that it's the stepping outside of the legislative framework that gave birth to our system of law in the first place. Well, well, that's right. But you also have to bear in mind, as Marx pointed out after 1848, the bourgeoisie uh, disdained its revolutionary origins. <laughs> you know, so, so yes, that's how a bunch of things come about. But the point is that, you know, that after 160 years where every ruling class around the world has said, all right, now we are the party of, of order and, con and doing things through to the constitution. Um, now it can actually feel incredibly difficult to, to recreate that moment. Um, so yes, in a sense, um, yeah, there's in lots of ways, there's nothing new about my book totally, but, but sometimes you have to remind people of the old lines and the old arguments and the old possibilities because, you know, the, the practical realities is, is that all those things seem, can seem very, very distant to people. I mean, like, you know, in Britain, for example, I, I suppose here I'm kind of trying to say why I think people can kind of believe what I'm saying, but why it isn't at their high enough up their list of what's achievable and, and, and actually gettable. And, you know, the truth is, after Britain, we, we had a really exciting moment. We, you know, you had Bernie Sanders, we had Jeremy Corbyn, and Corbyn gets smashed. What happens to the Labour Party in Britain afterwards? Um, it's now led by a lawyer. It's led by a lawyer who, um, in his youth, was a Marxist, um, who, I'm a member of the Haldane Society of Social Lives. He was um, on the committee of the Haldane Society of Social Lives for many years. Um, all sorts of my comrades will talk to you about, you know, um, the ones who were from Labour Party backgrounds, how he was insufferable because he was the most Marxist person you'd ever meet. Um, you know, he'd go up to them at, at parties and he's like, they'd be going, do you want a drink? He says, no, you, even the fact that you're, you're putting to me that I should have a drink shows you're not a proper revolutionary if you were Marxist. And that's Keir Starmer. Now, what does Keir Starmer do right now in British politics in 2023 after the defeat of Corbyn? He's incapable of starting an interview without saying that he was the former director for about 10 years of public prosecutions. I don't think you quite have an equivalent role in, in the States, but you certainly have public prosecutors. So he is the head, head public prosecutor. He says he wants everyone in the world to know he's a cop. He was the head of the cops. He was the biggest cop. He was the guy who got the cops to act their, their investigations to actually lead to prosecutions and convictions. That was his job. And he, he's tried to line up the entire British left behind the idea um, that, you know, in order to get to 50% plus one majority support, you have to persuade, you have to run everything in line with the speed of the cautious and conservative people. And they love the state. So we have to be the people who love the state too. So, um, yes, um, liberalism emerges as a revolutionary ideology. Um, yes, even social democracy originates as a revolutionary ideology. But you just have to remind people of this really quite hard. Um, because otherwise, life, the life that just carries on and, and continues is that we all get sunk behind these strategies which disenfranchise and frustrate millions of people and they then start seeing the left as the enemy and we don't want them to see the left as the enemy we want them to be part of the the, the broader movements that's actually going to deliver real and lasting change yeah so in in chapter uh three of your book uh you discuss the the proposal by lord briggs of um expanding online courts um, where civil, non-criminal claims are uh, that that have total claims of less than twenty-five thousand pounds will be moved to a digital format. Um, 
I found your critique of his proposal as, of creating a sort of system of justice for for me, not for thee, of where 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 only the rich could access um, the proper halls of justice, and everyone else was relegated to a spreadsheet. Um, to be very convincing, but um, but you also imply that there is something to the notion of online courts, something to using digital technology that, that, that's out there um, of potentially um, reappropriating aspects of his proposal or other proposals like it into a more egalitarian vision. Um, I'm curious of, of where you think um, that could develop um, and how you think that could develop. Well, I hope that um, if, that my count overall is at least 1920th anti and only 120th pro. Um, I'll come on to the 120th that's pro in a second, but I'll, I'll think about that. I mean, j just say that. I mean, it is worth bearing in mind. Um, you're right in the book. It's mainly talking about. I'm mainly talking about civil rather than criminal law. But but actually, kind of what's happened, which is weird, is although this was introduced an idea for civil law, actually in Britain it's happening fastest in the criminal law. Um, that you know we, we're getting um, we're getting um, now now what happens if, if you're before the main kind of our main kind of criminal court which deals with the large majority of criminal cases our magistrates court um, the idea is you get an app and you swipe to see if you're going to plead guilty or not guilty and um, there are many many bad things about this is it's as a system that's kind of going quite slowly through the, the criminal system and, and it ties up I mean you talked about justice through a database it, it clearly ties up very strongly with another thing which is going on which is kind of the, the and actually it's, I think it's happening faster in the states which is the automation of um, the um, sentencing stage where you know someone's already been found guilty so you basically give an app the job of deciding how long people will go will, will spend in prison um, you know, there's been loads of really interesting work done about um, how the really sophisticated apps are based on models of who's more likely to commit crimes. And strange, lo and behold, um, they will say things like, well, you should give someone um, two or three times as long sentence if they've got if their skin's the wrong colour, because on the information we have, people whose skin is the wrong colour are more likely to have had contact with the police earlier in life are more likely to have already had a lengthy jail term. So if they're convicted, we can just assume they're more likely to be convicted again. So you give them a longer sentence now for the same punishments. So, you know, the digital dystopia is, you know, that's that that started and is going in a certain direction. And it's certainly going that direction in, in criminal as well as civil law. Um, now, the one twentieth that's pro, if if you had a more democratic legal system, um, I guess one one of the things that that, that occurred to me when I was writing um, the book was that I've I've kind of maybe this isn't the position that, that I had when I was a much younger socialist. Maybe when I was a younger socialist, I just believed that you know once you get to communism, then at that point of society there'd be no more courts and no more police of any description whatsoever because all the big social questions would have been resolved we're sort of now being an old fart i'm like slightly willing to accept that even under communism we might have disagreements between people and some of those disagreements might actually need someone of some kind of independent position to listen to both sides and say well just speaking for myself and based on my experience of life you know what i think you're slightly better your argument persuades me more so if we are going to have um if we are going to have um legal systems in future things which kind of like the law and they're not quite the law as we understand it now even in in a, in a very different future i i could certainly see that there might be practical advantages to having um a partially online rather than purely in person court system whether that's to do with who can be um in the room whether that means you can draw on kinds of expertise which you know you know th there have been times when when um social movements have thrown up whole legal systems which are really rich with smart intelligent people who've been shaped by the struggle so, so in my lifetime 
um, you know, you think about um, the judges who went through the, the transition in South Africa and how absolutely it's a set of people. They're really, really, really impressive. And they're really willing to consider things like, for example, environmental justice in a way which, um, say, no judges in Britain would ever be willing to consider because they hadn't been through the same process of struggle. You know, I quite like the idea that, you know, um, if we did have not necessarily environmental courts quite, but certainly some systems so that, you know, you could, where, where an independent person could expropriate a remaining manager or, or owner of a business. Um, I would much rather, you know, um, the judge who did that was someone who knew something about Maori land law um, or someone who'd been through a, a struggle like the South African struggle rather than just a bunch of, you know, the, the British judges who I'm up against every day of my working life, who um, no matter what revolution we've all been through, they still won't get it in five or ten years' time. So if online courts could be a way of sharing some really cool, interesting legal technique that's only been worked out in one part of the world and hasn't been shared yet, yeah. Um, but but all of that's based on, like, the context of, like, the complete abolition of capitalism and private property, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, the remaining use for it, imagines really quite a different world before I start going, yeah, okay, I could see some value to this stuff. That all actually touches on one of the things I found most fascinating about your book. For a long time now, I've actually had quite a similar conception of communism. You get the sense that how some people talk about it is almost this uh, utopian vision of the resolution of all contradictions among people. In some sense, the abolition of difference. Maybe the Foucauldians are onto something. <laughs> um, but you know, how I tend to think of it now, and I think there's a lot of evidence that Marx and Engels also thought of it in this way, was that communism isn't the abolition of contradictions among people. It isn't the abolition of differences among people. It's uh, about for the first time in our history, placing the power in the hands of people in a real, in a meaningful sense to resolve those contradictions, differences, disagreements amongst themselves, rather than deferring authority and power to some higher and ultimately unaccountable power. Um, and you have this great line uh, in the last paragraph of the book, actually, you say, in any conceivable future society, even the most equal, people will disagree and have arguments. There does not need to be a separate code of knowledge associated with a specialist cadre of decision makers to reconcile these conflicts. So one of the themes underlying your book uh, is less so the abolition of law, but the democratization of law or, or the, demo, demo, the democratization of the functions of the state. And you know, if, if any further evidence <laughs> that this is in keeping with the vision of Marx and Engels is needed, one could point to the very recent retranslation of the Critique of the Gotha program uh, by Pete Houdis et al., uh, which points out you know, quite a serious issue in the uh, hitherto existing translations of it, where a variety of nouns were just translated as state. So Marx and Engels talk of uh, Stat Funktionen and Stat Wesen and der Stat, but in effectively all translations prior to this one, they were all just rendered state. So I was wondering uh, how close the affinity is here between, you know, this vision that Marx and Engels seem to have of uh, the democratic assumptions, the, the democratic assumption of the functions of past society as being the real truth and vision <laughs> of a communist future. First, I, mean, I didn't know about that, the, the retranslation um of the critique was really interesting. I mean, that doesn't surprise me, but it's lovely to hear about, but it's not something I, I knew about. It's certainly not in my book, but um, one of the things that, that, that they, they do though, that, that, that they confront, and it goes back to what I was saying earlier about them being the older generation in relation to, to, to these sort of young people who can visualize themselves actually having state power. Um, and one thing they just talk about constantly is that the, the slogans which these people are pushing forward just aren't getting it and one of the classic slogans they push forward which just doesn't get it is the idea that you know everyone should have um an equal wage 
And you'd have thought that, you know, because lots of people simplify marketing, so marketing is in favour of equality or substantive equality or textured equality, but equality. You thought, therefore, they'd be really keen on that. But, but those sorts of demands, again and again, they say, this isn't our project, this isn't our programme. And, you know, if you think about it, there's some really obvious reasons why it wouldn't be either now or in future. And, you know, the reason just now is that actually people do have greater needs and you want to funnel resource towards people who have the greatest needs. You don't just want to have everyone um, having their, their needs met on, in a constant and equal fashion. And often when I can talk about something which... which emerges within the present day law, but which I feel is kind of like gets Marxism much better than the people who feel that Marx is just ultimately a primitive egalitarian. Um, one thing which I think gets is actually an idea we, we, we have which germinates within present day law for all these weird reasons, despite the limitations of the law. But it's the notion that in relation to the demands for disabled people for substantive equality in the workplace, in housing, in relation to benefits, etc., what they should have, we talk about it in Britain, is the concept of reasonable adjustment. And the reasonable adjustment actually means they should have better treatment than non-disabled people. Now, it's different from positive discrimination, but to which it sounds like, but it's different because it's specifically targeted at disabled people. But it's targeted around the idea people have needs. That means you have to really, 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 really take their needs into account seriously. So, you know, one of the practical consequences of this is that, for example, um, in, in our ordinary housing law, um, if you're a public body in Britain and you want to um, evict a disabled person from their house, essentially because, um, for example, because they're in, they're in rent arrears, it is incredibly easy as a barrister's job to stop evictions to go, apply the Equality Act, apply the concept of reasonable adjustment, think through what a person's needs actually are, think through why they're failing to engage with the bureaucratic state and therefore that's, they're not getting the benefits they're entitled to, that's why they're in rent arrears or whatever, and think through and think through the margin of additional better treatment you have to give them. And I often feel that concept actually captures the bit of Marxism which is saying from each according to their ability to each according to their needs. It's not give everyone 100 quid. It's think through the barriers that someone's actually facing in their life and address them, seriously address them. So, um, and that's not just something that, that Mark Singles say in one place. It's something they say in 30 or 40 different places at different points in their writing career. Um, so, I don't know, to my mind, it's pretty obvious that that's what Marx and Engels meant and you know if this translation helps show that great but if people haven't got that it's just because they they've got this not from reading Marx but from that general thing where people pick up their Marx from their assumptions of what a Mark, what Marxism ought to be well you remember Karl's response to that in the 1870s all I know is I'm not a Marxist um, and it was, it was in relation to that assumption that he made that he made that joke you you discuss in your book um, uh, the, a, a distinction between um, rights and access and the notion of ghost rights, which has kind of been following along with a lot of this discussion. Practically, I suppose. Then, um, how is there a way to <laughs> is there a way for for these uh, ghost rights or rights that only exist on paper? Um, that are inaccessible to to millions of people who perhaps need them um, in housing or disabled folk who are unable to to afford a, a barrister or an attorney um, to assert these rights. I suppose what it, what do you see as practical mechanisms to improve uh, those rights of access in the immediate uh, in the immediate. Um, I think first I just do need to slightly explain this concept of ghost rights a bit more because for people who haven't read the book, it, it, it's um, and I love the way in which at the moment I start explaining ghost rights, the screen goes black. Um, <laughs> but 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 look, the the idea of ghost rights was um, I'm really interested in this thing which happens under neoliberalism, which is that neo people think that neoliberal the neoliberals as their project just wanted to privatize everything smash trade unions and do it all in two seconds flat. Whereas actually what's, what seems to me to happen under neoliberalism a lot is because the neoliberals 
are quite kind of Marxist in their attitude to state power, which is they have really, really, really big ambitions. They know you can't get everything all at once. They fight to win one thing they can achieve, and then they fight to win another thing they can achieve, and they just keep on fighting forever. And to my mind, that's how we are, or at least how, how we should be. But I think it's actually how we are. We keep on pushing until we get that total transformation social relations, but they do it too on their side of the argument. Now, the point is, therefore, because neoliberals often act quite slowly, often make relatively incremental changes, because that's all they can achieve in that particular moment, is that you get um, all sorts of rights which, in theory, haven't been abolished, but actually no one can apply. So to give an example in Britain, it might be something like, um, it's not that long ago that... Um, I know 80% of people in Britain had a final salary pension scheme. So when you retired, you'd retire at the age of 65. You'd get, say, say if you worked at the business for um, 40 years, you'd get your final salary and you'd have that until you died. Or if you only worked there for 10 years, that's 10 out of 40. You'd get a quarter of your final salary, but you'd get it until you died. So we used to have, under the post-war years, really generous pensions. And what's happened with neoliberalism is that some some sectors of employment they've had 30 different changes to their pension schemes so like depending on the year that you joined and depending on the year you are in now you might get 39 40 so what was a very generous scheme we might only get 10 40s and there's all these different gradations of all these people in slightly different legal status according to how long ago in a sense the rich or the state fought a battle with them and won it and that's an example from pensions. But but if you think about legal rights in general, um, across law in general, there are just vast numbers of people who've got um, all sorts of rights um, that they just cannot enforce. Um, so so what do you do? Your, your question is how can you make how can you bring a ghost right back to life? And I think the answer just has to be you, you, it's much easier to do it outside of the law than it is to do it through the law. Um, I know incredibly talented lawyers who are regarded by other lawyers as the best of the best, who in one case in their lifetime managed to resuscitate a ghost law. Uh, there's, there's, I, my chamber is a guy um, who's died now, Stephen Nappler, and he just settled on a legal strategy one year, which is he dug up a law from 1948, which no one remembered still on the statute book, and in a case in 1991 persuaded our are then House of Lords, we now have the Supreme Court, but he persuaded our senior judicial court that um, that rather than say to asylum seekers that they couldn't be couldn't have work or benefits or anything, they had starved to death, that they were actually still um, governed by this law, which no one remembered still existed from 1948, which meant the state had to give them a decent enough lifestyle so they could live and eat and carry on living. So, so incredibly talented lawyers in the perfect concatenation of friendly legal circumstances can take a ghost right and make it a real right. But, you know, actually quite often it's just social movements do this. You know, I mean, I had in Britain, we had rent control from 1915 to 1981. That's 66 odd years. For 66 odd years, the, the landlords couldn't just increase rent as they liked. How was that achieved? It was achieved essentially by a demonstration of around 15,000 women through Glasgow saying, given that all our men are fighting in the war, we don't want there to be any rent rises for the duration of the First World War. And, and a state turned around and saying, we can't defeat these people. We can take them on, but we'll lose, conceded, and therefore conceded to the granting of rights which lasted for, for 60 years. I, I don't know enough of the American history to know, you know, have there been similar processes where, say, um, rent controls were on paper, seemed to disappear, then actually, say, under COVID, suddenly came back into play again. If that happened, I'll bet you anything, it, it wasn't because some well-meaning legislator woke up one morning and said, oh, AOC's got me on the phone, so I've got to do this. If it happened, it happened because social movements were demanding it and politicians felt they had no choice but to concede it. And, and you know, if that's happened, that's how things have happened in the past is how things are going to happen in the future too.
I think hearing you talk, I can definitely uh, understand your maybe begrudging respect for a better call Saul. Is <laughs> picking up bits of impossible and forgotten legislation and then putting them to work. Um, uh, I think we still have a little bit of time. Uh, so I'd like to ask you one last question from my end, a little bit more about kind of the political theory side of the book. We've, we've covered a lot of the, the legal theory side of it. Um, there's this a uh, popular line of argument, maybe you've heard it as well, which you encounter a lot among leftists today that refuses to distinguish between you know, various right-wing ideologies since when push comes to shove, we know that they'll all band together against the forces of change. Conservatives, liberals, even social democrats have given us plenty of reason to suspect that they'll form an uneasy alliance whenever radical change is put on the agenda. Uh, but in this book, uh, you very carefully distinguish between neoliberalism and populism. Uh, what would you say is gained by drawing this distinction of what does it consist and how does it help us explain the state of the law today? Well, if you don't understand um, which exact enemy you're facing in a moment, then you're going to be powerless to resist them. Um, in, in my writings about fascism, um, um, I appreciate this isn't you know, I don't want to go too down, the, too far down this because it could become a bit of a red herring. But in my writings about fascism, I often tear my hair out at all the people, particularly in the States, who insist on calling all sorts of different things fascist. Because if you turn around and try and analyse something as fascist and develop tactics and, and follow tactics which have been developed for stopping fascism and apply it to something which isn't fascism, then the people watching you are going to go, that doesn't make sense to me that that's just not a credible approach and i'm not going to follow you because what, what you're saying is all based on a set of assumptions which i don't share and you're not going to persuade me to share them um so exactly the same that, that you you have to know what the sharp bit of of your enemy is what their potential is and why certain things they're doing are succeeding if you if you want to counteract them so you know in the states obviously under trump it, it made all the difference in the world between you know there were plenty of people in britain who would say um the limits of how far trump will go is he's essentially going to be a conventional republican in power um well that may have felt right for the first three and a half years but it didn't feel right <laughs> around january the 6th and if you if you don't have an imagination which is capable of imagining how badly that was capable of going then you're just going to miss it you're going to be there going what do i do um so you need to know what your enemy is. You need to know what what's, um, what they're likely to try. And you need to know, crucially, you need to know um, which of their various moves are likely to have a popular appeal. Because if you don't understand why your enemy's got a popular appeal, how on earth can you answer them? Um, so I think maybe one of the political things which is behind my book, which you don't always get in left-wing theory, is I'm absolutely serious about this idea that we become the majority, that we're capable of, with our ideas, we're capable of running this society way better than it's run now. And to get to that point, we're capable of getting a majority of people to support us in our ambitions. And so therefore, if we haven't got a majority yet, which pretty plainly we haven't, then we've got to start thinking, who are the next set of people who we can win? And what is it that we can say that can win people? And, and go about that task seriously. Take we take our own politics seriously so where does that get you for the law um i i suppose one of the things that it that at least i'm trying to understand is um the really sharp pivot that happened nearly a decade ago but certainly so certainly like seven six seven eight years ago which was um all the major fractions of pro-capitalist politics idealized the law they all said the law is great. You as an individual voter, you need to obey the law. And when they said that, that was something that, that people have been saying a very long time. You know, in Britain, when Margaret Thatcher took on the miners, she said, um, they are the people, they are the threat to the rule of law. And that was the most powerful ideological weapon she could use. Well, go forward to the last six or seven years and serious chunks of pro-business opinion, both in Britain and the States, have been saying why on earth do you need to obey the law? Um, you know, like right now in Britain, um, we have a campaign which is about trying to get drivers 
out of old polluting cars into new cars which won't cause kids asthma. So in London, there's something called ULES, which is an ultra low emission zone, which is designed to try and make take a real baby step in the direction of a less polluting world. Um, every single national newspaper in Britain that's the right of centre, which means seven out of ten of them, is running daily articles about how you can smash up road cameras, how you can take down the infrastructure of the state, which is seeking to compose ordinary people and to compel ordinary people, to, which no one in their right mind could accept. So we suddenly got rather than all laws must be accepted in the state, anything is great because the state says it, we suddenly got significant chunks of capital saying all experts are wrong. A lot of the time, the state is your enemy. Now, at the left, unless we can work out a counter move to that, people will do that. They'll strike a popular register. Thousands, hundreds, thousands, millions of people will line up behind this thing. And we'll be going, well, we've got, we've, we've definitely got the political answer to last year's issue. We just don't have an answer to this year's issue. And I don't know, you know, we're not going to get the sorts of processes I'm talking about, which is a kind of benign de juridification of rolling back the law and the state and the police and the prisons and so on, unless we can line up people behind that. And to do that, we have to cut through the new kinds of right wing arguments, which striking chords with people. And I say, look, the people who say this stuff, it's not going to deliver the change you want. And here's why it won't deliver it. So I suppose the argument in the end is all about politics there. It's not really, we, we have to understand why the, why the right shifting, it, it does have an impact on the law. But we have really the reason why we need to understand it is otherwise we'll never win. Well, I think we're actually just about out of time for this conversation. Um, so I was wondering if, just in closing, uh, there's anything else you'd like to throw in the mix for our listeners? Any closing thoughts or uh, anything you want to plug? Any projects you have going on at the moment? I, I won't try and plug anything. I mean, look, the one thing I, I suppose I would say is that while I'm proud of the book, the one thing that in retrospect, I wish I had uh, written about just a bit more is about the relationship between the stuff that I'm talking about and, and the idea of police and prison abolition. Um, because because I, th I think this is implicit in the book, but it's not totally explicit. One thing I'm absolutely certain about is you can't fully, fully, fully make the case for those kinds of abolition unless you've got sort of got some notion of legal abolition. Um, and it, I've sort of got this because over the last year I've been doing a bunch of meetings with people who, who've been doing, writing books about police and prison abolition. They'd sometimes get me along to speak with them. And, um, and kind of it's implicit in my book, but it's not quite explicit enough. One of the arguments I always make in those contexts, and I do want to put it here, is just it goes something like this. And it goes back, I suppose, to you know, that, that story I was talking earlier about Patsy Stevenson and Sarah Everard and, and the kind of notion of all cops boss, where that comes from. The reason why my book is called Against the Law rather than just Against Law is what I'm trying to get at is, is that the law is a total set of things which people follow because they, it's what they think the law is, even if the written law is actually something else. Because in Britain, far more than the States, we've had many years of social democratic governments, and those social democratic governments at times have passed significant reforms and often those significant, significant problems, again, the police are completely ignored. An example often used, I think this is in the book, but I'll, I'll sort of draw it out anyway, is the notion of um, laws against landlords illegally evicting people. Since, um, since the mid-1970s, we've had laws which said that if a landlord tries to evict someone without going to court first, so they're committing criminal offence, and they can be prosecuted, and they're the ones who should go to prison. But the practical result is if, if you are ever in that situation yourself and you are ever trying to stop yourself being evicted and you know that there's a law saying the landlord can't evict, you phone up the police and the policeman comes, the policeman always arrests the tenant and not the landlord. And it doesn't matter how many times you write a law that says in that situation the police should arrest the landlord. The police just don't. And it's because they have a notion of their social role. It's like in the laws as a totality, there's always a deference to property. And we are the people's job is to apply the laws in their totality. And we know the laws support the property. So without needing to look it up, I just know the law will say if a tenant objects to being evicted, they're committing criminal offence. And, and this, I think, is kind of a key problem with reformism, with the idea that, you know, if we just got a few reforms in, we could we those would 
would mean that the state would just would have to do what we want and not what the rich want. It's because people got the job of enforcing and implementing the law. And if they don't know what the law is, they go back to their accurate idea of what, how the law generally works, how the law generally operates, and therefore obviously and logically how it will behave in this situation. And you can't deal with that just by changing the wording of laws. You can only deal with that ultimately by changing the, the property relations and social relations which the laws are there to implement. So I suppose that's kind of the argument of my book in a nutshell, but putting it in terms of criminal law and police and prisons rather than civil law, which is how my book is pitched. But all, I suppose all I'm really saying in the end is that I hope that when people read it, they'll see that the things I'm saying about the civil law apply over very obviously and straightforwardly to the criminal law too. Yeah, well, thank you very much for that clarification. Again, I think we're fresh out of time now. So I just want to uh, say one more time, thank you very much, David, for joining us. And thank you, Brahim, as well, for taking time out of your busy schedule. Uh, if anyone is uh, interested in learning more, uh, this is the book. You can pick it up on the Repeater store or just about any other bookstore around the UK that you can imagine. Uh, and hope you all have a nice day now. <laughs> Thanks so much, Kenny. We appreciate your support of the imprint and the channel. Subscribe to Zero Books today on Patreon. Your material support helps us to promote a variety of perspectives on the left. Also, discover the many titles, new and old, that Zero has curated. Navigate to any of the links in the show notes to extend your support.